Good morning, distinguished guests. I've been trying to find three reasons that allowed me to stand here under the spirits of Gustav Klimt. So far, I only found two. First thing Pam already mentioned, I published my first uh, debut, my first novel in 12 May, 1998, exactly 10 days after the military regime collapsed. It's not funny. <laughs> the second thing is um, I was asked to submit a painting for an auction to, find, to, to raise funds for a museum of human rights in Indonesia. Um, only one painting were, was brought, and it was my painting, and it was bought, brought by, it was bought by a man named Lukman Saifuddin Hakim. A few months later, he became the Minister of Religious Affairs. And the third amazing fact that I'm going to read this text in front of very respected uh, scholars. Once upon a time in a faraway land, there was a child who lived with ghost stories. She lived in a stone house that was built by the giants in the colonial time. It means the house was planned by big white people and meant for their family, even though the labor was provided by small skinny brown people at the time when there was a big difference between being white and colored. For reasons that the little girl didn't understand, the white left the land, a Chinese that owned that house for a couple of decades. Then in the year she was born, her father took over the house. Her father belonged to the government people. He had a gun, which he kept in a steel chest in his bedroom. The Chinese was probably a businessman who had committed some wrongdoing, or maybe he was a communist. The girl really didn't know. What she did know and strangely got fond of was ghost stories. Listen, there are different kinds of ghosts. Gendruo live in the jungle. Siluman guard the rocks and caves. Kuntilanak stay in tall bamboo groves and like to fly from tree to tree while laughing like crazy. Kolong Wewe. Look out for a chance to kidnap little children. And pochongs hop around cemeteries like giant cocoons. But Alice, all those exotic ghosts reside in nature, in forest, on trees, at graveyards, places and spaces where men are not in command. They are not really part of us. But hold on, now there is one ghost a city ghost. Beware, the grown-ups like to tell the little girl. Beware when you hear the echoing sound of a peddler's slit drum in the middle of the night. He might sell satay or mi goreng or mi godok or mi tok tok or meatballs. If it is very late in the night, you better beware. There have been reports about people going up to a midnight street cellar and ask for a plate of satay, or mi goreng, or mi godok, or mi tok tok, or meatballs. The seller wore, head, wore a hat and would prepare the order without comment. After a while, he would come with a strange dish, and only then you would realize that he has no eyes, no mouth, no nose. His face is flat. He is called Setan Murat, Setan Mukarata, the flat face phantom. When most ghosts are nature's being, this ghost is the phantom of civilization. He is part of us. I was the little girl who lived with ghost stories. I didn't make up the stories, I just tried to interpret them. The flat face phantom seems to have made its debut during the military regime. It continues to appear in different versions from town to town, and you may come across it in a conversation when erudite discussion have finished. Some foreign friends of mine raised this question. 
Why in Indonesia do we so often end up talking about ghosts? Are Indonesian modern people who live with half their head in the mythological realm? Now, as the, little, as the girl who grew up with ghost stories, I want to invite you to see ghosts, not as a mere superstition. Let's be more appreciative about ghosts, because I love them, and because our modern visions are not so different from apparition of ghosts. Pat Ben Anderson, especially in Imagine Communities, explained beautifully and insightfully about how imagination has shaped a nation. Indonesia is a vision made true. Republic Indonesia started with the ghost of meaning. But if you don't want to call it ghost, we can call it spirit. Let's talk about spirit. What is the spirit of Indonesia? We can talk length in length about this, but let's make it short. A num in a number of crucial crises in Indonesia's history, for example, the 1965-66 turmoil or the 1998 reformacy and its following consequences and consensus, Indonesians tend to read the outcome of the crisis as the triumph of Pancasila and Bineka Tunggal Ika. Of course, history is written by the winner, and that doesn't make it necessarily bad. I want to call the union of these two formulas, Pancasila and Bineka Tunggal Ika, as the very spirit of Indonesia. This picture shows a spirit awakened during last year's presidential campaign. This massive gathering of volunteers had a double motive. One, to continue an ancient spirit of diversities, kebinekaan that was deemed threatened by the rifling parties at the time, and two, at the same time, to bring a new spirit. But what is a spirit? Am I not being unfair to those who don't believe in the spirits? I grew up with ghost stories. Can I have a common language with, the, which, which, with those who lack ghosts in their lives? The spirit is technically the ancient or non-ancient codes that pass through time. I am, of course, inspired by Dawkins' meme. The spirit is not only an energy that moves people at certain times, it is also a set of codes that replicates through the centuries. Like language, it has synchronic and diachronic aspects. Interestingly, the Indonesian language has several words for giving birth to a newborn. One of them is persalinan, which also means copying, duplicating, replicating, transcribing. From root word salin, when a woman bersalin, she gives birth, she gives birth to a baby. When a person menyalin, he or she copies something. The social copying of codes happens in a formal as well as in an informal way through individual will as well as communal pressure, through practice and through law. Indonesia's founding parents give birth to a nation with a set of particular codes for its existence. The smallest parties or the basis of the set is likely the one sentence, Bineka Tunggal Ika, or the unity in diversity, the, Indonesia, the nation's uh, slogan, and next to it is Pancasila, our state foundation. Those who studied Indonesia's history know that this consensus on this set of code has not been without challenge since its inception. The challenge came from the Islamist groups who wanted to include the Sharia into the state's principles. Aware of the future complication, the Christian groups choose to withdraw from nation building if the Sharia was to be included in its foundation. The consensus was, finally, to keep no mentioning of any specific religion in the Pancasila as it, happened at, as it had been proposed. 
However, there was a compromise about the order of the five principles. As we have it now, the belief in God become the first principle. The earlier version of Pancasila did not put faith as a first priority. And when they did mention ketuhanan, technically would be godity or godism, but we better translate it as belief in God, they did not mention the one God. Now we see that the monotheistic faith has transmitted part of its code into the set of codes that become the DNA of Indonesia for better or worse. To be frank, I don't know the benefit of having the belief in one God in my state's foundation, because so far I can only see the complication of a monotheistic will of power, which I will talk about later. I think it's better to have spirituality. The formal coding of Pancasila is worth examining for a moment because it shows how translation or recoding to other language proved to be not very easy, and this difficulty relates to another complexity. The five principle in English Wikipedia are belief in one God, or belief in the one and only God, Two, just and civilized humanity, the unity of Indonesia, democracy guided by the inner wisdom in the unanimity arising out of the liberation amongst representatives, social justice for all of the people of Indonesia. To tell you the truth, it doesn't feel the same in my language. <laughs> it doesn't feel the same. I have lived with ghost stories. I grew up with the formula of Pancasila in my native language. I don't find them strange until I'm outside the languages, the language of ghosts, the language of Indonesia. Once you are in the exterior, you start to lose the interior comprehension. This is the complexity I want to explore a little further. It's like when you wake up from a dream, you no longer understand your dream. Looking from the exterior, I began to cry. How come they sound so weird now, this just and civilized humanity? Is there unjust and uncivilized humanity? This democracy guided by the inner wisdom in the unanimity, blah, blah, blah. Very difficult. And this belief in one and the, on, the one and only God. How come? most of the things now appear to be in weird shapes. There are several intricacies relating to this matter, but I want to stress the difference in the capacity to understand when you are inside or outside. When we concentrate on the replication of codes, we see things from the outside. We tend to lose the capability to comprehend the meaning. We only know the structure, but we lose the meaning. From the outside, the spirit of Indonesia is the replicating of certain codes by which there will be a continuing, continuing identity. The replicating process takes place through daily practices, discourse and law, and through regular political consensus. An example from last year's presidential election, the winner was the group that refrained from religious fanaticism. The national consensus, once again, opted for the side that doesn't exploit religious sentiment. In a sense, it replicated the set of codes agreed by Indonesia's founding fathers. The threat of pan-Islamism keeps lurking. That means, technically, the competition between the replication of pan-Islamic set of codes and the set of codes of Pancasila dash Bineka Tunggal Ika keeps going on. However, to see the subject from a distance and to look at it as a matter of code replicating or code replication, our understanding is doomed to be devoid of meaning. But now, what is meaning? 
What is the meaning of Bineka Tunggal Ika and Pancasila? For this moment, I'll start with a simple thing. If something has a meaning for you, you will have a feeling for it. It will have a feel. It will have an interiority in you. It is not just an exterior coat. It is an interior experience. Indonesian language has a word for the sum of feeling, sense, sensitivity, empathy, intuition, capacities alike, with which we know something through our experience and existence. It is rasa. The Japanese pronounce it a little bit differently and regard rosso very highly in their art and daily life. Now I shall define rasa or rosso as an interiority of the set of codes. Rasa is through which we feel the spirit or the codes. But before we talk about rasa, let's talk about one other important thing. Now, Jokowi is president of Indonesia. People have begun to get disillusioned by the economic sluggish, the execution of capital punishment, his being undecisive on the battle against corruption, and his weak position against his party's elite. However, relating to our topic, the current Minister of Religious Affairs is worth our attention. He is the one who bought my painting. <laughs> Unlike many of his predecessor, Lukman Hakim Saifuddin fights corruption in his department, he tackles religious disputes, he doesn't exploit fanaticism. In one Islamic celebration in the, in the state palace a few months ago, he led a reintroduction of the Quran recital in Javanese style. The local style of Quran recital is not new. It's a centuries old practice in the religious boarding schools known as Pesantren. It became less known with modern standardization during the Suharto era and it is really marginalized in the democratic era that coincides with the trend of globalization. But globalization is also read as Arabization. The reintroduction of Japanese style Quran recital created a controversy and in turn revealed a rather forgotten concept of Islam Nusantara. This literally means Islam of the archipelago. The subject has been studied in some Islamic uh, universities, but has never really gone out from the campuses. Islam Nusantara is welcomed with high optimism as well as with controversy. Its supporters argue that it is just natural and good that Islam is expressed in local cultures. When a religion is expressed in native tongue, it will touch the rasa of the people. But its opponents argue that the notion is against the oneness of Islam. They condemn it as another kind of syncretism. Syncretism is another key word to understand Indonesia's history. Now, when I was in elementary school, my history teacher spoke about syncretism in a very positive tone. Syncretism is our ancestors' precious capability by which they settled differences and maintained peaceful unity. As a child of the military regime, I always thought that school teaches us what is good and bad, and certainly syncretism is a good thing. We were taught about the Shiva Buddhist temples of the past that showed the mixture of religious teachings, and we were proud of our ancestors' local genius. We learned about Nagara Kartagama, a book by Empu Prapancha from the 14th century, in which our modern Indonesia founding fathers got their inspiration for Bineka Tunggal Ika. We read about Islam Waktu Telu, a traditional community that practices three instead of five times prayer, and other sects. We visited cemeteries and prayed according to our religion. It could be Islam, Christian, Hinduism, or Buddhism. So syncretism is a pillar of Bineka Tunggal Ika. I only get started to get confused about syncretism when I entered 
Universitas Indonesia. It was only there that I realized the monotheistic puritanism's enmity towards syncretism. It caused me to become a bit disoriented. The, there is rupture in my nation's history. Syncretism was good in the ancient time, but it is not good in the modern time. Why? Later on, I realized the opposition, not only among the preaching religions, but, also, but of the Puritan monotheist groups toward local spirituality called kebatinan. In literal translation will be innerity. Not being a religion, not being institutionalized, not having fixed identities, kebatinan is open to any teachings. Therefore, it is a mechanism of syncretism. From an exterior perspective, syncretism is like software that will regulate different or contradicting contents in order that the computer can work and not explode. This is a set of processing codes that has managed to self-replicate for centuries in a massive amount in the body of Nusantara so that we can call it the spirit of Nusantara or the spirit of Indonesia. But now, it is opposed by the Puritans, especially the monotheistic Puritans. The battle of what seemed to be between syncretism and Puritanism made me think. My gut feeling is against Puritanism. European scholars may find this gut feeling too obvious. Secularism is a given thing in today's Europe. It's a different case in Indonesia, where in Indonesia, Indonesia, it's very common that graduating students will thank or dedicate their thesis in writing in the first page to God Almighty. Puji syukur kepada Tuhan Yang Maha Esa will be decorated the first page of the thesis. There are more and more postgraduate students who study on fellowship in Europe or US or Japan and come back home more religiously dogmatic. Uh, you can ask one of my friends here, I think Burhan Muhtadi, who did research on the very modern uh, Islam, Islamic party, uh, that members are very highly educated in a modern education. So to, to the surprise of European secular intellectuals, religious dogmatism is not a middle age phenomenon. On the contrary, it fits the postmodern era very well. The Puritan's attitude is usually intolerant toward difference that makes them not nice. But what's wrong with their argument? The Puritan's arguments have a good level of logical consistency, at least compared to the syncretic explanation. Now let us examine the competing codes that are reshaping Indonesia's identity. We have syncretism on one side and religious puritanism on the other side. And there is also critical mind on one side and dogmatism on the other side. How do they compete? It is important to note that the postmodern ideas have advanced so far as to questioning the legitimacy of universal human rights. Critical reasoning investigates everything and finds there is no basis for, every, for anything, even for truth. The idea of universal human rights is bound to Western biases. Ironically, at this very point, the religious dogmatic mind agrees eagerly. Universal human rights is an invention of Western uncivilization. There is no truth if we resort to our reason, and exactly because of that, we have to go back to God's eternal law. With this complicated logic, certainly we can argue that Islam Nusantara is an Indonesian invention, or Javanese style Quran recital is a Javanese invention, and therefore less legitimate, or if not illegitimate. 
The advantage of the dogmatic mind against the critical mind is that its double standard attitude allows it to be critical of others, but not of its own basis. In this way, it keeps its basis firm. What the secular, critical, objective, scientific, you name it, mind disparages, it's exactly the strength of the dogmatic mind. Faith solidifies illusion. The competition between the critical mind and the dogmatic mind is like a shooting, competition, a shooting championship of a certain kind in which one, the dogmatic rifle shoots only to the front like normal rifle, but the critical rifle shoots to the front and to itself. Two, the dogmatic faith solidifies the base on which it stands, and the critical mind destabilizes its own base. I am afraid that the critical mind is doomed to fail if it doesn't change strategy. I hope I'm wrong. But what about the competition between the Puritan mind and the syncretic mind? The Puritan has sharp arguments. Syncretism doesn't have arguments. Studying cases of attacks on minorities of local beliefs, assuming that local beliefs are an important locus of syncretism, one will realize how weak is their argumentation and articulation capacity. I opine that it is not because many of them come from a poor, uneducated background, because some of them are university graduates, but because the very structure of syncretism lacks logic. It lacks logical consistency even on a superficial level. Rather, in its interiority, to reconcile differences and conflicts, it resorts to rasa namely feelings, sense, sensitivity, empathy, intuition. Now we're coming back to rasa. What's wrong with rasa? What's wrong with rasa? The Japanese appreciate it highly. In Clifford Geertz, the religion of Java, or in Magnus Seno, the Japanese ethic, in the writings of Kihajar Dewantara, of, or of the Dalangs, and local wise people, in various testimonies of traditional dancers, musicians, artists, or artisans, we learn how rasa has played a vital role in shaping Japanese communities. Born into a Japanese family, I've never been taught about rasa in an explicit and explanatory way, exactly because rasa is not about formulation. It is the sum of feeling, empathy, sensitivity, sense, intuition, and the like, which are known through laku, or practice or habit. It is about relation. Magnus Useno, a German Catholic priest in Java, shared same experiences with me. To pacify a crying child, a mother told her kid, dear, stop crying. Look, there is father priest. Or, hey, there is guest. Through probably the child cried because another kid had hurt it. She would say it in such a way that the child would learn to be bashful about how it had behaved. In a slightly heavier case, when I was very annoying, my mother would say to me, look, your father is coming. And I would learn to be afraid of my father. And other members of our extended family would tell me about ghosts. So I, don't, I didn't get the ghost stories from my parents. Beware, don't do that, there is ghost. So the priests, the guests, the fathers, the ghosts were the others to which a child should learn to relate. Relation then was more important than reason. Now I suggest that knowledge has a feel. It is the interiority of knowledge. The interiority of knowledge is how we feel the knowledge. We have talked about the spirit of Indonesia from the in exteriority as the replication of codes. Now I want to talk about the feeling and the meaning, the rasa and magna, as the interiority of the spirit. The technical question would be how the replication of particular codes is felt or experienced. Assuming that syncretism is an important pillar of the spirit of Indonesia, 
that is Pancasila and Bineka Tunggal Ika, I would say that tenggang rasa is the feeling in which this set of codes is experienced. Tenggang rasa is an expression for the feeling of empathy, tolerance, and other feelings associated with them. Important to note, this feeling can only exist in intersubject relation. It cannot exist when one takes others as objects. Other important expressions associated with tenggang rasa are tau diri, to know oneself in relation with others. Tau malu, to feel shy if one doesn't behave or one doesn't know one's position to other people. The feeling, or rasa, of something brings us to the second aspect of interiority, that is the meaning or the makna of something. The feeling of the spirit or, or of the set of codes bring us to the meaning of it. What is the meaning then of syncretism? It is what syncretism holds valuable. It is intersubject or interexistence relation. It is coexistence among subjects. It is tenggang rasa. It is based on rasa. So what's the problem? The problem is of rasa is that it doesn't speak the language of reason. This is not just a romantic answer. The fact is that it shouldn't be a problem until reason becomes the only language of knowledge. We know since the beginning of the age of reason, the age of light, slowly and surely reason has been marching its way to be the one and only language of knowledge. The problem of syncretism then, that it relies on rasa, and rasa doesn't speak the language of reason. The problem of syncretism is that its mechanism of rasa leads it to containing too many internal inconsistencies and contradictions which it cannot defend against the judgment of reason. Now, what is the problem of reason? Postmodern philosophy has exposed to the roots the problem of reason. On this occasion, I will focus only on the interiority of reason. I resort most of my time to my own contemplation. I have implied earlier that knowledge has a feel. We feel good when we think we know the truth. We don't feel good when we think we don't know the truth. If there has been any neurological explanation about it, I will be very happy. Logic has an impersonal and strict mechanism, but when it takes place in our brain, it will be bound to have interiority. It will have a sense. It will be experienced with a sensation. The good sensation of reasonal truth links to the state of apprehension or control over something. We know knowledge is power, knowledge is about control. This makes reason very different from rasa, of which good feeling links to intersubject relation. The second big difference between them is regarding their mechanism. The mechanism of rasa is a play of balance and harmony. The mechanism of reason is progress that aims at truth. When it thinks it reaches the truth, it gives the brain an orgasm. It is a pleasure-seeking mechanism. Reason is then libidinal. Rasa is like love. Reason is like sex. <laughs> Imagining the interiority, that is how we feel the reasonal truth, unfortunately, the critical scientific mind and the religious dogmatic mind are not so much different. Both seek pleasure, the pleasure of truth. They may be different in how they formulate their truth. The critical mind may tend to be negative and deconstructive. It will likely say there is no God and values are relative, while the dogmatic tends to be positive and constructive, like there is God and his words are fixed. But each side, and each side may accuse the other of reaching to a pseudo-truth. 
However, both are driven by reasonal pleasure and orgasm. The problem of reason, again, is that it is libidinal. Now, let us go back to the situation in Indonesia. Indonesia has the spirit of Bineka Tunggal Ika, where harmony is maintained through a feeling of tenggang rasa, or empathy and tolerance, and potential conflicts are reconciled through synchron synchronization, like Pancasila, and syncretism. The process he has relied on rasa, but the problem of rasa is that it is likely to contain internal contradiction and logical inconsistencies. It cannot defend, defend its paradoxes against the judgment of reason. On the other hand, especially since the age of reason, reason has nearly become the sole language of, for truth. Unfortunately, dogmatism is a legitimate part of this wave. The dogmatics argument may be crude and primitive according to the critical scientific mind, but they are no different in the interior sensation. They feel the pleasure and the orgasm of truth. Truth is tempting and desirable. Now, this is the danger. If the critical scientific truth is too sophisticated and difficult, some people may resort to a quickie kind of truth and dogmatism. The problem we are having now in Indonesia as well in the world is that the domination of this libidinal reason is even fostered by the mass media and the digital information technology. There should be more scientific research on the content or other aspects of digital information technology. But as a journalist and as a writer, I have been involved in the formation of public opinion since the Suharto era. And without having to look too deep, the difference between the past time, the military time, with censored conventional media, and today, democracy, and nearly uncensored conventional as well as new and social media, the difference is very obvious. In the past, you had to have courage to speak up. Now, everybody wants to be heard. In the past, people had to think before speaking. Now, people speak first and think later. Moreover, through content hits, Anybody can follow and exploit people's desire. Through likes and retweets, truth becomes more pleasurable. What I find alarming yet challenging is, is this very short format of text of the new media. You have to be understood in 140 characters in tweeters. News gets shorter, even in print media, as if they are adjusting to a smartphone monitor. People want to have the orgasm of truth as quickly as possible, even though it will be a fake orgasm. The visual, mixed media, and, a, and very short form of text is a challenge for all of us who are concerned with public opinion. But it has proved to be benefiting to the dogmatics, because dogmas fit in less characters. Critical thinking needs more words to express, and contemplation needs a whole life. Dogmas are probably the best fit for the new media. Unfortunately, when the skeptical mind gives no hopes, faith gives you passion. By looking at the interiority of reason, that is the libidinal reason, we can understand why some people can join ISIS. Meanwhile, Rasa has, in the first place, been having difficulty in defending its choice of syncretism against the judgment of logical consistency. So, one important pillar of the spirit of Indonesia is actually being shaken. Bineka Tunggal Ika is facing a big challenge, probably bigger than what it had in the past. Will Indonesia lose its spirit of unity and diversity? Certainly, I am the supporter of Bineka Tunggal Ika, and I am patriotic on that. It's a faith I will defend. Because the magna, or the meaning of it, is intersubject relation. And the rasa of it 
is tenggang rasa or empathy. It's not quite different, it's not quite the same, but very close to compassion. It is for me deeper than reason. The role of reason is to check whether the meaning is true. In centuries past, when rasa still reigned, people in Nusantara didn't have to account to reason for the syncretic steps they took. Nowadays, as reason is taking over the world, reconciliation of differences cannot rely on rasa alone. It has to undergo a test of reason. Unfortunately, syncretism may not pass the exam. Therefore, we, the proponents of Bineka to Ingalika, cannot depend on syncretism alone. We have to develop another pillar to support Bineka to Ingalika that will survive the judgment of reason. Here, I suggest critical spiritualism. What is it? A Twitter explanation of it would be, Critical spiritualism is an openness to the spiritual without betraying critical thinking. A critical thinking that is not close to the possibilities outside its limit. A critical thinking that is aware of its problem. A situation in which spirituality and critical thinking engage in a good dialogue. The dialogue between Habermas and Cardinal Ratzinger is an effort of this kind in the secular Europe. Not necessarily that Habermas is critical and Ratzinger is spiritual. In Indonesia, where most of the people are embracing religion, the major dialogue may need a different form. A symbolic Javanese-style Quran recital in the palace a few months ago has managed to reintroduce to wider audience the notion of Islam Nusantara, in which inculturation and intellectual exercise walk hand in hand. The proponent of Bineka Tunggal Ika in Indonesia or of humanity in general need to convince the world that a good dialogue between, between critical thinking and spirituality is possible. It will cross-cut the dialogue between secularism and religion and will help the world fight not only terrorism but any form of dogmatic violence. For certainly, humanity is not just a set of codes as any other set of codes that will survive or not survive in this world based on its fitness to self-replicate. Certainly, humanism is different in its content, in its value and feeling from theocracy or even secularism. Theocracy, dogmatism, as well as secularism seek for truth. Humanity and humanism seek compassion. Those who accuse humanism of being an invention of Western civilization may look to the experience of Indonesia. Through the language of Rasa, the Nusantara's people have articulated Bineka Tunggal Ika and various other expressions in languages of the archipelago. Humanity is an articulation in the language of, re of reason and it is historically Western, yes. However, if we look to the language of Rasa, we will find a huge treasury of expressions in the same spirit in various cultures. The total sum of those vocabularies of reason and of Rasa will make us understand that there is indeed a true spirit, a true spirit of being a subject who lives among subjects, of being an existence that exists among existences, we can regain our faith in a true spirit. Once upon a time in a faraway land, not only there were one little girl, but there were millions of children who lived with ghost stories. Ghost stories made them thrilled and made them scared, made them happy and made them sad. Ghost stories make us feel what is not real, but what is real. Strangely, the ghost is the common enemy of two mortal enemies, the religious dogmatic and the secular critical mind. In fact, it is not that strange, as the ghost appears in the language of Rasa, while both eternal foes speak the language of reason. Now, listen to uh, the echoing sound of a slit drum in the middle of the night. It may come from a peddler 
saying, selling satay or mi goreng or mi godok or mi tok tok or meatballs. And you may come across the flat face phantom. I like him because he is one of a very few urban ghosts and he appeared for the first time during the era of the military regime. Believe me, he will convey the moral of his own story only if you dare to listen to him as he stirs the soup with the strange things bubbling inside his pot. He could be stirring his own eyes, mouth, nose, and heart. The beauty of the ghost is that it speaks to you in metaphors, but you don't want to take it as metaphors. He said to me, you may be living in a house confiscated by a certain regime from a minority or a political outcast who himself had taken the house over from flee fleeing colonial giants who had previously occupied the lands of the small brown people who probably had been envying each other and so on. You may be living in a house called Indonesia or a house called Earth, but our past is never clean and pure. So now this is his moral of the story. If your libidinal reason renders you lustful for truth and your sensation seeking keeps your rasa in the superficiality of experience, you'll, became, you'll become self-righteous and self-complacent. You close any chance of dialogue either with your enemy or between the inner capacities of your own self, between the critical reason and spirituality. Then you will start dropping your eyes, ears, mouth, and heart, and end up with an empty, flat face, the phantom of civilization. Indonesians still love ghost stories. Probably it is just another manifestation of our spirituality or another way to introduce spirituality to our children a kind of kindergarten spirituality that is not meant to be trapping you. Let's cherish it. The challenge of the world today is that it is too much dominated by libidinal reason. We need rasa to balance it. We need a dialogue between the best of reason and the best of rasa, between the critical mind and spirituality, a dialogue that will lead us to the union of truth and compassion. Thank you.